Hello, India has over 200 ports, of which 13 are what we call major ports. Now, we'll come to what major ports means versus minor ports in a moment. But there's a lot of interest and activity happening in the Indian port sector after a while. We're seeing a lot of private interest particularly and privatization of ports. So all of this means that there is belief that the Indian port sector and by extension trade and commerce and overall economic growth is obviously going to look po positive, but also grow at a fast clip. So if you were to, were to look back and see the kind of investment that we're seeing in ports today, where could we go potentially in terms of what we are investing today? What is the potential? And let's, if we were to ask some fundamental questions, what are the kinds of ports there are in this country? What is the kind of traffic that they're geared to deliver to? For example, uh, you, uh, as you know, I'm sure, uh, we import crude oil, uh, we export uh, refined product, uh, we export or used to export rice and wheat to large num uh, for large numbers, but we've cut back on some of that. But we obviously continue to import other things. So where does all this come together and uh, how does the Indian port sector look in that context? So to discuss this, I'm joined by Captain Jimmy Saab, uh, formerly chairman of P&O Ports in India and uh, now an independent consultant. And uh, I'll be asking him and requesting him to take us through in, a, in the form of an explainer how the Indian port sector looks like and how it works at a very fundamental and basic level. Captain Saab, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we have uh, th what we call 13 major ports and there's a definitional thing and I thought I'll allow you to, you know, sort of give us that definition because it gets, can get a little confusing, you know, who runs the port, who owns it and uh, what is the dynamic between the person who owns it, in mostly being the government and the person who runs it, uh, being in some cases at least the private sector. So let's start there. Well, India has 13 major ports, as you said. Uh, port Blair is the latest port that has been added. So that becomes the 14th if you take Wadwan being the 13th which was added. And there are approximately seven on the, so 14 ports, seven on the east coast, seven on the west coast. And this term minor that has come from 1897, according to the Indian Ports Act, is really a stupid term, minor. The word minor means that a minor port is a state government port and a major port is a central government port. So the 14 ports that we are talking about are administered from Delhi as major ports. Minor ports are little, 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 little ports right across scattered along the coast of India. And these are called minor ports because it is administered by the state governments. Or let's say in Maharashtra's case, it is the Maharashtra Maritime Board. In Gujarat's case, it's the Gujarat Maritime Board. So to explain what is minor, that is how, how it is. But minor ports are gaining a lot of momentum of late. One example and a stark example being the Mundra port, which started as a minor port. Today, it is the largest port in India. Can you call it minor anymore? You can't, but the term exists. To change the term, some legislation is required. But technically, to answer your question, this is how the major and minor is defined. Right. And how are the other minor ports? Or let's put the definition aside now. Let, let's say government versus non-government ports or private ports. How are the other private ports doing in terms of growth? So Mundra everyone knows and has been following because as you said, it's now the largest. Who are the others? Well, basically at the moment, uh, the Adani group has most of the minor ports. They've managed to win them. And uh, I can say that technically they are now much bigger than the government of India's ports because they are really doing a good job and managing it very efficiently. Mundra being a perfect example, which started as nothing. There was just sand dunes there when we took it over. And I had the privilege of going with Mr. Adani just now on the 12th of December. And he very kindly took me around and shown me the, showed me the port. And it was amazing what he has created. And Definitely, we need more ports like that to cater to India's ambition of becoming a 7.3 trillion economy, as Modi ji says, by 2030. So we need more minor ports to be developed, including a major port like Wadwan, where in 1996-97, we had envisaged 300 million metric tons in the first phase, 500 million metric tons in the second phase. And in the third phase, we had envisaged 800 million metric tons. So that was a mega port of Wadwan that was going to fill in the gap that existed 
on the capacity of Indian ports. If we want to take on China, if we want to be globally challenging and competitive, we need to build world-class mega ports. And Wadhwan will be an answer as a major port to it. And Gautam Seth is already creating lots of other things himself. Right. Right. Okay. So, I'll come back to the owners of the ports and the management of it in a bit. But tell us about ports themselves. So, we've had ports obviously for centuries in India uh, and uh, or at least for maybe several decades. Other countries including the newer economies or tiger economies like the Southeast Asian countries have also built them. So, why is it that India has not had let's say more efficient ports? Is it because of natural disadvantages or other reasons? The main reason originally was that the government decided to only handle and manage the ports. And I personally have said right from day one, from the time I have come here, government has no business to be in ports. And we proved that when they privatized the first private container terminal in India, which was the Navasheva International Container Terminal, we changed the paradigm of the way shipping and containers were handled in India. And that is exactly what should be done going forward. More capacity should be brought on by private sector. I kept saying that the existing JNPT 680 meters of key line should be privatized the day I was bidding for the port. 25 years later, they finally privatized it. So the thinking now is that it is better to let the efficiency of the private sector come into right. the port's play. So between the construction of the port and the management of it, what, where is it that the private sector involvement matters the most? Firstly, India has this tendering process, which is normal. Globally, it is done. Unfortunately, at some stage along the tendering process, the builders got in. And then they came out with these point systems. I think that builders should not be in this uh, running of the ports. They can come in to build the port and leave rather than qualify with all their points to make the port. Because after they make the port, all they do is sell it and go away. And then you need a good port operator. So you need port operators to bid and win the ports. And then build them, equip them, put the IT systems in to make it efficient and run it. That's how I think it should be. And this norm, I have said this all along, highest bidder who gives me royalty gets the, gets the award, which is wrong. What should be really looked at by the government of India now and the private port and the minor port governments, state governments is, who is giving me how much equipment, turnaround time of the ships, efficiency. These are parameters that should be weighed in on awarding a contract. How much money are you investing in the port? What type of equipment are you giving? How much employment are you creating? Did you know, Govind, that for every one job that is created in the port, four or five jobs are created logistically outside the port? So with, one, with, with our population, we need to give jobs to people. And therefore, the more ports you create, the more employment you give to the youth who's coming out. Right. So, I'll come to the management of ports in a moment, but tell us about the, the, the natural part of it or the nature part of it. All ports are not as well positioned. Uh, they don't have the draft to right. receive big ships. Now, India is, seems to be at a natural disadvantage there and or that's one. Second is, if we are at a natural disadvantage in the areas where we want to have ports, what does it take to bridge that gap in terms of construction or capital investment? Well, all the natural harbors or deep water ports that could be built have already been built. Now, if you look at Rizinjan, you look at Wadwan, you look at any new ports that are coming up, you have to go outside. You have to look at the deep water contour where it comes because you want 18 meters of natural depth. So you have to go off the coast. This way you avoid all the environmental problems and you and you prevent all the red flags that keep coming up for every single thing. Fortunately, the government ensures that this red flag system is stopped now and ports development goes ahead. So we need to go out. We need to find areas where the deep water contour comes in, where there is a rock shelf, 
So you can excavate in the dry by building a coffer dam around the rock shelf, getting the water in into the deep water state and then developing the port. So, but you know, developing the port is only one thing. You need fantastic or very, very efficient and good connectivity between road and rail. You need to bring in and take out the volume seamlessly. And that is another folly for India that doesn't happen. Mundra, Mr. Adani has bridged that. I went there and I saw how he has created all these big broad roads and highways and everything in order to evacuate and bring in his volume. That is what is required for any new port development that takes place and the government with all the money it is earning from royalties in different ports should look at not only six laning the, you know, the roads and as I've again from my piano days always said, Concord needs to be privatized. We need private operators. I have fought for the rail corridor so many years ago. We went and made a representation with Manmohan Singh. Finally, the freight corridor is happening. It's not finished yet, but when it happens, it will be a boon. This is only between NSICT or sorry, JNPT and uh, Delhi. But more freight corridors need to be created for connectivity, right. for efficiency. So you're saying that if there are any natural disadvantages, for example, in the harbor, that's not something that can be, I mean, that's not insurmountable. You're saying the larger challenge is really ensuring that uh, the goods get to the port and uh, obviously get out as well. Absolutely. Through now, connectivity. So you're saying that's the bigger challenge as yeah. compared to building the actual port and even if that's at a natural disadvantage. Yeah, now you have dredgers who can dredge deep channels for you. You have equipment which is good enough to blast the rock shells out to create the basins for your port. Machinery, technology, everything is now available. In India, the challenges are the human capital, where the humans say we don't want the port. For no rhyme or reason, they will just say we don't want the port, which is wrong. If India has to prosper, it needs ports. And as of now, did you know that China handles 44.5 million metric tons to India's 11.4 million metric tons? I'm now only talking about containers. And if you look at the volume, India handles approximately 1.5 billion metric tons of overall cargo to China's 15.4 billion metric tons of cargo, 15 times more. So if you want to compete, we have to have more ports and the present government is looking at developing more ports. But are you saying that the, uh, I mean, environmentalists have their reasons for, let's say, opposing a certain project, but you're saying that if we had more ports, we would have automatically reached the numbers that, let's say, China is doing? I think, assuming, yeah. I think the Indian entrepreneur spirit is very strong. I think if the capacity is there, the volume is there. When I started at NSICT, I'll give you an example. In the first calendar year of handling our NSICT port, we had bid that we would handle 150,000 150, TEUs. When we came on stream, Govind, we handled 487, 192 TEUs. This is fantastic. So to say that where is the volume going to come from? No, the volume will come if you show that you have the capacity and most importantly, you have the efficiency. When we came on stream, we did 29 moves per hour per crane while JNPT next door was only doing nine moves per hour per crane. So what happened? The customers moved to us. Same way, if you create capacity with efficiency, the volume will come. And if India wants to go to 2030 as a $7.3 million dollar, uh, trillion dollar economy, we need more efficient ports, Wadwan being for starters as an absolute go-ahead ASAP. Right. And, and I'll come back to that in a moment. If, if you could compare for us now, let's say Singapore, everyone talks about it. There used to be horror stories in India about ships waiting for 30 days to, True. to birth. Uh, that obviously has come down now and we are close to international standards. But what are international standards today, uh, whether it's let's say a top port in China uh, or Singapore or Rotterdam or and versus let's say where we are in India and where are we uh, or where should we be focusing on or where should our efforts be in which direction? It is extremely important 
that vessels don't wait for births. When the vessel comes, the vessel should be brought alongside and efficiently loaded and discharged. That is important. I can't speak for everybody else, but I can tell you that at piano managed terminals, our vessels did not wait. And if they had to wait, it was due to pilotage, which was government controlled or draft dredging and all that. As far as we were concerned, we allocated windows to certain shipping lines who called as our customers to our port and we handle them efficiently. And that should be the norm going forward. Vessels should not wait for births. So what's the, give us a sense of turnaround times today uh, versus let's say the international benchmark that you think, for example, is something to look at and what should be our aspiration? I think the minimum is 25 moves per hour per crane for containers. As far as oil is concerned, depending on the size of the vessel, of course, but any uh, big vessel should be discharged within 48 hours because India imports most of the oils. Mr. Adani has got a good SPM there up at Mundra, which I saw, which is doing efficiently efficient job. But if you look at Butcher Island in Bombay, or if you look at uh, Madras, or sorry, Chennai, the discharging there is still slow because it's government operated and it's not meeting the international norms. If it is privatized, it will meet the international norms, which is what should be the aim. What about container ships? Container ships, again, depending on which the port? number of TEUs that you are bringing in and loading out. So for you to ask me a question and give you an answer is very difficult because it well, all whatever. depends Let's say on an average size container ship, well, how long would it take to turn around in Singapore? Or the same size ship, how long would it take to turn around in JNPT or Adani port? Well. Any vessel that went to Singapore... If Singapore is the right example. Singapore I is a good example. Yeah. They are very efficient. And they turn around a decent sized ship within 24 hours. And at NSICT or at CCT or at MSI, MICT, where we operated as piano ports, we turned around the vessels exactly in the same way. As I said, our delays were more related to pilotage, towage, tuggage, all the other things that we couldn't control. In Adani's case, He's managing the pilotage and he's managing the dredging. So it's working efficiently. Right. So, you know, this is the, the map of India. And, uh, you know, we can see that we have uh, ports uh, on the left side. And that's the west coast. And we have ports on yeah. the east coast. Seven and seven. Seven and seven. So how is, it this, how is this going to shape up? I mean, is trade going to drive uh, and the na nature of trade going to drive which ports will become more important? Or is, in, I mean, is this sort of spread what is ideal or optimal? You know, it's like sort of spread across the country on across the coastline. Well, each port from the coast is serving the hinterland. Yeah. And, you know, as India is a we, uh, it starts to bunch down a lot. So the competition in the south between Cochin, Walar Padam, now Wisinjan, Chennai, Chidambaram port, Tutikoran, all that is getting congested. Mm. But on the north, if you see, Mundra is very well placed yeah. where it is. It's serving the Delhi hinterland, the north hinterland, UP. So, strategically, it's very well placed. Similarly, West Bengal, Calcutta. I mean, this Netaji docks and Haldia and all is all defunct, man, in my opinion. I mean, because they don't dredge the channel, we had tried to do a port called Kulpi there, which never really took off. We were going to use the Rangafala channel instead of the normal channel, because the normal channel keeps silting, silting. up. And you can't, and the minute the draft goes down, the ships have difficulty, you know. So, Paradeep, Vizag, these are all bulk sort of ports, more than containers. They handle more bulk volume because of way the iron ore, mm. Tata yeah, steel, that was my and question everything. Actually, yeah, yeah that, that, so, geographically, I think our trade is more with the West. So, the West Coast will serve better. And now with the new, gov not new, but the government's ideology of linking certain things in order to sort of compete with China on the one road, one belt system where Modi ji has come, come out with this new scheme of going. I think Wadhwan and the JNPT and all the JNPT container terminals and all are beautifully placed. It should work. Right. So in, in general, I mean, if you look at again the West Coast and the East Coast, where would you think that we should be investing more resources in terms of either new ports, if I don't know if that's a possibility, or let's say making existing ports bigger and of course more efficient. Well, I've always 
advocated that Indian volume should move to and from directly from India. So, but if you show me the map and ask me, then I have to look at the world sea trade routes. And if you look at the sea trade routes, then south is more important because people are going out of the Red Sea, although there's a problem with the Red Sea at the moment, as you know, but otherwise they are going right from the Red Sea. So the south where you invest in port, which is where Mr. Adani has invested in Visinjim. Walarpadam is a good example. These are good ports that you can invest in, but the diversion that we are talking about is not a lot at all. Because even if you did bring the vessels to the south, the volume is more to the north. So ports like Wadhwan, JNPT, Mundra especially, they are all well located for the volume movement within the Indian hinterland to go to. We cannot neglect the east coast, China, we do a lot of trade with China. Chennai is well positioned. Enor is a port where Mr. Adani has done a joint venture with uh, TIL, which is an MSC subsidiary. That's a good combination. So, yeah, Vizag, a little to the Vizag, north. Mm. containers, you know, I mean, the world is moving towards containers now. So, we have to look at containerization. And with India doing more and more of cars, we have to look at car terminals because cars is a big thing now. And India can develop good cars at a good price. Tatas, let their cars get exported. Therefore, we need good Roro terminals everywhere. That should be looked at. Right. And car exports are growing. I mean, whether it's uh, they, Maruti they, or they, they uh, are growing. Hyundai. And, and so oil. And oil. Okay, I'll, I'll come to oil in a moment. But uh, you talked about Visinjam. That's a transshipment port. Yes. Tell us about what transshipment ports are and will this, was, what, what, no, what will this serve? Or rather, what will the Visinjam port serve specifically uh, in, in the overall, our overall objectives of? Well, you already heard me. I'm not a supporter of uh, Indian volume yeah. being transshipped at all. Yeah. Even if it is over an Indian port, I'm not an advocate for that. But what Visinjam is going to do, and it's a great concession that, Mr., uh, that Adani said has, so it's good. What is a transshipment port? The volume will come the Indian volume will come and get discharged into Visinjin or even other volume, even African volume can be discharged here. So it's a, a hub and spoke system. So the main line will be the hub which will bring the volume, it'll discharge it, it'll go into the yard, the container will come back onto the feeder vessel, the feeder vessel will then take the volume to the respective port, from there it'll be shipped into the hinterland. So you see, there is time involved, there is money involved. I'm not going as a transshipment terminal, I'm not going to give you this move free. It's costing me money to take your box off the vessel, put it in my yard, then when the feeder ship comes, bring it back and put it back onto the ship to send it back. Then when it goes to its original origin port, it'll again have the same move there. This is expensive. And how do you measure money in terms of time? Time is money. Every day the port, every day the box sits into a transshipment port, it's costing the importer and exporter money. But it was money. trying to solve a problem, isn't it? I mean, which is that uh, this was getting transshipped elsewhere, maybe Sri Lanka. It has no business to go to Sri Lanka. I've always said that. No, but that was happening. I mean, that's my it, question. It, and it continues to happen, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Indian volume should come to India. So why are they go not, from India. So why are they not coming to India? Because the port capacity is not there to handle this. And the big motherships cost a lot per day. So they don't want A, any form of diversion from the normal sea route that she's going on. And B, she doesn't want to wait. She wants efficiency. Transshipment ports normally do give better efficiency than a normal port to a certain extent because they are geared up only for that purpose. Okay, let's look ahead now and I'll come back to oil in a moment. So uh, the, there's the hardware and there's the software. So tell me about the software. Software obviously brings about the efficiency. It ensures that let's say ships are coming in and going uh, at, uh, in a way that you know, everyone knows what's going on. You can monitor their arrival. You can obviously uh, manage their, uh, uh, their uh, operations while they're there and obviously ensure that they leave quickly. So what are the efficiencies to be gained on that side and where are we in India at this point? Well, the software that you're talking about basically is the terminal operating system. 
or the cargo operating system, be it in the bulk. Yeah, I'm terminals. using the word software a little broadly. I mean, that includes human capital, the technology, everything. Everything but the, the physical, let's say, the ports. Okay, so for, for software, you need very good blockchain systems, which is now the new mantra, as you know. And blockchain is really uh, revolutionizing the, the way everything is being done. So you need a good terminal operating system called TOS, be it Navis, be it Tata Consultancy, who, when we were here, we developed a system with Tata Consultancy. So you can use any terminal operating system, link it with the blockchain system, so that with one piece of paper, we know where the container is. We, when we go into the system, we know where it is, where it has to go, how it has to go. Now, you keep, you know, this old-fashioned way of terminal operating systems and all. What we need to look at is procedural systems also, as far as software is concerned. If you have a delay at customs, if you have a delay with CISF, which is something we always had, and I pulled my hair out saying that I want efficiency. We need efficient custom systems. We need efficient CISF inspection systems. We don't want delays to take place. If you want to bring machines to find out if there are drugs in the container, install more machines, but have a seamless procedure of taking the box straight through into the port and bringing it out from the port. So that is important. Custom procedures, CISF procedures, these are also to a certain extent soft, as you call it, you know, apart from the terminal operating systems, which in my opinion, if it is efficient, it, it just goes very quickly. Everything goes very quickly. The hardware is your QCs, your RMCs, your RTGs, your tractor trailers, and the whole process which moves the box within the, within the port or within your container terminal. Right. And you said moves per hour is one way of determining how efficient a port is. Yes. So, and, and you're saying that basically Indian ports, particularly private, uh, are today at, at a level which is world class in terms Absolutely. of the number of... Absolutely. So the people who run them are as well trained and as well exposed or... Absolutely. And India is a human capital drain. Most of the foreign uh, ports, after we have trained them, they take these people on a higher wages and they go. Absolutely. So and way, when, when, yeah. I, when I started it, I was challenged on the number of people I would employ. And I said I would employ PAP people, which is the project affected people at Navasheva. So what did I do? I ordered a container, a simulation system for my container cranes. I took these villagers and farmers from the fields. I put them on, onto the container simulation machines and made them learn how to handle the crane. And we did it exactly the way the crane would behave, the seat of the crane would behave and how the jerks would be. We introduced rain, we introduced all kinds of dust and everything so that the vision is impaired and how this guy will handle it and train them. Once we train them and they become very good and they're up and they go, they go to Singapore, they go to Dubai, all these people keep stealing them. But well, that's good news in a way because they, it's, it's, there's upward mobility for these people and True. And, and you'll create fresh jobs. True, but we are, you, we are, slow we are down investing in the, in the human capital, which yeah. is then just being picked up. Right, okay. So, uh, you know, as we look ahead, uh, you've, you've given the figure, the 7 trillion figure, which 7 means 7.3 trillion a billion uh, trigger to uh, uh, more exports, more economic growth and all. So all that is, it's a given in a manner of speaking. So tell us about how you're seeing the, the, the composition of trade and how the port sector will be or could be better geared to meet that, including through, let's say, the Vadwan kind of ports, which, again, illustratively, I'm assuming is, is the most or potentially the most newest generation port that we will see. Absolutely. You see, Mumbai and Navasheva is now very heavily congested. So you need to let it off, let the steam off from this congestion because as you and I know, we are suffering on the roads. We can't get to, from A to B. It takes too long. And all these trucks and all these volumes and the rail traffic and all slows everything down. Now, Wadwan is just north, uh, south of Danu. But it's 140 located, kilometers from Mumbai. Yeah, it's located well. It's in a quiet area. The volume can move there if you give good road and rail connectivity. Depending on what is there in the hinterland, cars can come. 
container volumes can come. The same container volume that is going all the way to JNPT doesn't need to come south of Vadwan. It can just turn around at Vadwan and go north. That way you decongest Mumbai and Navasheva and Navi Mumbai at, to start with. I am not saying that Vadwan will take away the volume from here. It will not. The way India is growing, it will not take away the volume, but it will help decongest the cities. And that is what is required. Oil also is required to come up there rather than come to Butcher Islands, I feel. So would you say that uh, as a country, now we're obviously seeing a lot of port activity, including by private sector. Would you say that ports like Vadwan fulfill therefore more than one objective? One is to obviously take away traffic from existing old cities like Mumbai. The other is to sort of maybe set a benchmark in terms of what a world-class port could be. And if that's so, I don't know, I mean, could you explain to us what could... Well, we had envisaged Vadwan to be a mega world-class port. We were designing it on the Rotterdam. So, I had always said the slogan was, Vadwan was the Rotterdam of India. So, by that I mean, we are setting a very high benchmark in terms of efficiency, in terms of terminal operating systems, in terms of discharging, loading, time, time is money. In every aspect, we were looking at Wadwan that way. Now the port is being built outside. It's got an 18 meter natural draft, which is good. You're not dependent on tide. I don't like being dependent on tide. The ship should not be waiting for a tide. It should come is a natural thing. Wadwan can create, bridge that gap, which is what is required. There will be more Wadwans required as India grows. Wadwan is already too late. Remember, we planned it in 1997. We are 26 years late. Okay. Right, and last question. So, uh, in your own vision of ports in India, what's missing and what is the sort of unfinished agenda? I think what is, what is missing is this educating people not to put up red flags all the time for any and everything. This is extremely tiring. It is extremely expensive. We need people, NGOs and all, to be educated rather than raising red flags. We need them to explain to the people that if the country has to grow, India has to be strong, then trade has to be strong. And for trade to be strong, it needs ports for volumes to come in and go out. That is very required. Custom procedures, I want them streamlined. Pilotage, I want that privatized. Dredging, I want private companies to come in as dredging companies to handle the dredging, to make sure that every time after the monsoon, there's siltation problems, the draft so gets Private reduced. companies can't do it now? They can, but you have 14 major ports. And by the time the government approves the tender, the draft has reduced considerably. And that is what used to happen at NSICT. That used to happen at CCT, which should not happen. If you want efficiency, you've got to streamline custom processes, CISF processes, pilotage, dredging, operating, road and rail linkages, privatized Concorde, create a dedicated freight corridor. Let's not build four lane roads. Let's build six and eight lane roads. With 1.4 billion people, there is a lot of volume that can handle, that can go in and out of ports. And if you want it, let's do it. Right. Uh, Captain Saur, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Sorry for being so forceful. <laughs> no, no, thank you. <laughs>